Welcome to the ninth season of the Combustion Chronicles podcast, where bold leaders combine with big ideas to make life better for all of us. I'm your host, Sean Nason, CEO of Offer Health and founder of Mofi. This season is all about amplifying the voices of badass women leaders in the healthcare industry who are influencing change by thinking big, putting people first, and not being okay with the status quo. Experience matters, culture matters, and revenue matters. That's why it's time to unite to ignite a people-first business revolution, especially industries that affect all of us like healthcare. Hillary Miller serves as the Vice President and Chief Learning Officer for Penn State Health. Hillary has more than 15 years of learning leadership experience, most recently serving as Director for Education and Quality Assurance at Paralon, a wholly owned subsidiary of HCA Healthcare. Her areas of expertise include public education, as well as for for for-profit and non-for-profit healthcare. She has also held leadership positions at Ohio Health, Medical University of South Carolina, and HCA Healthcare. She has special interest in gamification, agile learning development, and centers of excellence, and began her education career as a special education teacher. She held certifications in strategic communications, Lean Six Sigma, Crucial Conversations, and Epic Resolute Billing. Welcome to the Combustion Chronicles, Hillary. Thank you, Sean. What a career. Um, Just reading your certifications, I'm like, how did she end up in learning and development? But I love it. Love it. So you are the kind of person that I needed growing up to make learning fun because I did not enjoy learning and make me feel like I was getting somewhere with my efforts. So what drew you into the world of learning and development? Well, starting my career in public education, I always tell people there's strong arms in all of these things, right? And so I've I've been in learning literally my whole career. It's just a different facet. So when you have, have kids who are under 18 and you have performance standards and all of those things, it's really the same principles apply. The frames of reference might be different, right? Adult learning versus kids learning, but engagement and fun and play sometimes we forget that that's not just for kids. Adults need that interaction too and engagement. So I've really been in learning my whole life. I got into learning and development specifically within healthcare when I started uh, with the Medical University of South Carolina. And it really just kind of took off from there, moving into revenue cycle and the clinical aspect. And so I do not have a linear path. Uh, It's been a little bit of everything. I took on Uh, roles and positions that uh, people may have found hard, but I knew I had the skill set to support. And I've really just cultivated this big uh, tool belt of skills over the past, you know, 15 to 20 years, which has allowed me to apply some interesting perspectives in the L&D space. But I have a I have a love for healthcare. And I'm really glad to be serving in that space, especially now with with so much change. And so it's a real honor for me. Well, it's awesome. And and you kind of have a special place in my heart with having special needs children to know that your background is there. I say there's a lot of special needs in healthcare, and I'll just kind of leave it at that. So, <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, as an experienced evangelist, and I love the connections between experience, learning, and growth. So, where do you see the biggest intersections between experience? and learning. Sure. So experience from the standpoint of background skills or experience as in how are we creating experiences? How are we creating experiences? Yeah. So I think you, one, you have to, you have to know your audiences and where they're coming in from, regardless of where you are, people are coming in with different skill sets, cultures, backgrounds, and rather than making that uniform for everybody. It's saying what's the ultimate goal that we have and whatever this is, but also not being afraid to try some new things. You know, when I think about experiential learning and growth, 
it is not a one size fits all. It's what are you trying to do? How are we helping people apply that information immediately back on the job, but also create this? I use the word toolkit, tool belt all the time, but there are so many adjacent skills to things. So if I'm really great at critical thinking, I can apply that in so many fields, but I may not have the technical functional expertise. So that's why I say you've got to know the audience and what you're trying to do, but also what medium what delivery mechanism is going to going to result in in that best experience for people and we have a lot of technology that's out there today so i think you have to be pretty well versed into not going after those shiny objects but also understanding how that's directly supporting a learning opportunity and a lot of times we use learning synonymously with training education development the training development and education are three very different things Training is what I need right now because I don't know how to do it. Development is the things I want to be able to do. And then education might be those more formal practices like a certification or a degree. And so I think you have to have a pretty good understanding to create the right experience, even within those realms. I've never heard it broke apart that way, but I love it. And I love I love what you're saying around this concept. And this is kind of me getting on a soapbox and maybe being a little bit of a smart ass. But that learning, training, development isn't a one-size-fits-all. But yet, many of our education systems today are set up for a one-size-fits-all. I love that, you were, that, that you're thinking that way. So, so how do you overcome the challenges then of having to build programs that will connect with such a, a diverse population like you have in a mixed clinical setting such as Penn State Health? Yeah, it's such a great question. One is... I don't know that you ever really arrive and that you solve all things. So I think the more that we can get back down to earth with that to say that there's always going to be a complexity and there's always going to be a new challenge, which I find exciting, by the way. I don't know if that makes it good or bad. But when I think about what are we trying to solve for, I go back to the fundamentals assessment. What is it that we're trying to do? What is the gap that we see? Why is there a gap? But also looking at this isn't just about, you know, what am I able to perform in my job? It's how are we behaviorally bringing ourselves into that? The human skills get set to the side so much. I will not call them soft skills because they're anything but. But the human skills play into this. I could be the best technical functional leader on the planet. But if I don't know how to talk to people, I don't listen. I don't critically think it doesn't matter because the people aren't going to work with you. The people is the most important component because that's how the work gets done. And that's how we service patients. And so when I see teams that are having difficulty with how to get along, we go back to what's going on. What are your expectations of each other? How are you talking to one another? And so the human side of that matters so much to me because usually that's where it lies because we can teach you this other thing. But if you don't know how to talk to each other, you don't trust each other, you're not having open dialogue, you're sitting in silence or you're getting really angry all the time, you got to solve for that first. I love human skills, not soft skills. Because it's not soft and it's not easy many times. And, And you know this as well as anything, Hillary. We have this tendency in healthcare, let me say this, across corporate America, that we promote people because they do really good at business, but they don't have a freaking clue how to lead people. So it's easy to take corporate processes like onboarding. Let's talk about onboarding. And they are a necessary evil that everyone has to do within an organization. So how do you approach required experiences like onboarding? And how do you make them into something meaningful that sticks with people? Mm, That's such a great question. So I think it's one acknowledging that we have to have these things in place, especially when you're in a highly regulated environment that's constantly changing. Is saying, hey, you know, this is part of what we do and we know we have to maneuver through that. But also taking off the label of, gosh, this might stink of, gosh, this is why we have to do this. We have to protect you and our organization and our people. But this is where the fun part comes in. And this is really organizationally specific because the cultures are different. The people are different. What you might be doing is different. The landscape is different. 
And so I think when you can look at onboarding as an experience, so what are the things that they have to be able to perform? But what do we want them to know? Who do they need to engage with? How do we foster relationships right from day one where we've made it easier for people to connect to one another and help people be more comfortable with the fact that folks are coming in and out of organizations all the time. So you might not have the same team members six months from now that you did today. And of course, we're all focused on retention, but the reality is there's a lot of power and choice of where you work today. And so the days of somebody being a 40-year tenure employee, which is awesome, which we would all love to have, is not really the reality. So when you think about onboarding, it's literally the single most important activity because that is the introduction to the organization. That is the introduction to, we care so much about you that we've made these processes easier. And I don't know any organization that has that perfectly matched, but it's a it's an opportunity to fine tune that every single year to make it better. I do tell people, I did work for the Walt Disney Company and they have a pretty freaking... I mean, we all want to be Disney, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think... I think they do a really good job yeah. at onboarding. But people that used to work for the company 25 or 30 years ago yeah. said that it's not what it used to be. So same concept, but I think they do a really good job at it. So I'm going to ask you to go behind the curtain a little bit here. What's an exciting new project or pilot test that you have going on and cooking at Penn State Health? Workforce development. So Um, And this is publicly out there on a searchable page. So we created a whole new wing within the learning and development space for workforce development. And this is literally because we're an academically tied institution. So we have a lot of people coming into our organization to get their training. And so it's not only latching into that to see them as a future employee. On the flip side, we flipped money that we normally would spend with tuition reimbursement, found out that most of our entry level folks aren't able to tap into that because they can't afford it. They can't afford to pay it up front to then get reimbursed. So we said, we're taking that all off. So we took that money, created what we're called a grow portfolio. It's not an acronym. It's literally just grow. And it is where we started piloting programs. We actually had our first launch in July with a local community college where we are paying in full for phlebotomy, which is your lab tech that draws blood and medical assisting, which is such a critical role to, to in support of uh, our clinics inside our hospitals, but also to nursing and doctors. And so we have 41 students enrolled in this pilot program internally and externally. And the only condition that we had is once you graduate, you got to work for us for a year. That's it. And so we're really excited about what this is going to look like because we're going to start unlocking multiple programs in key areas like surgical tech and pharmacy tech. And some of it was just thinking creatively about the money is there, but we're not using it in a way that's beneficial. But the bigger problem oftentimes is not the program itself. It is the fact that financially, it is such a barrier for folks. But number two, they're having to make decisions between, do I pay for gas? Can I afford a meal tonight? So we wanted to lift off and we have a lot of improvement to make. That's why I love pilots because you get to make it better before you scale it. And so we know that we've we've good enough evidence that I think this is going to be a really good thing. That is so cool though. Like, you have the dollars, you felt like you were investing into your people, but then you realized it's not being used and here's why. So let's remove that barrier and obstacle for them and switch it. And what what a powerful way to, to look at that. Um, so I love it. Can't wait to hear more about that. When you're a kid, waiting in a line isn't much fun. But when you're always in the back of the line, well, that totally sucks. That's where Offer Health comes in. Our Smile MD business partners with dentists to move kids up from the back of the line by equipping dental practices with three person in office anesthesiology care teams who actually care about everyone they work with. Offer Health, improving the lives of the underserved and under resourced, one kid at a time. Learn more at offerhealth.com. That's O F F O R, Offer Health. 
creating connections, improving lives, care you deserve. I use a term a lot, Hillary, called maverick-minded and human-obsessed. So, and what I have learned about you from our network is that you're a little bit maverick-minded and that you're a a lot human-obsessed. So, your role is so important because it develops people professionally, but also connects them emotionally. Learning is an emotional thing. So, in the current healthcare climate, what areas of learning and growth are the most important? If I set the functional stuff aside, I think it's connecting people to the larger picture, right? So oftentimes we'll, we'll educate people within whatever domain that they're in. We don't help paint the picture of the connection points between, right? So if I don't have business acumen and I don't understand just the natural financial ways of things, I don't understand why some of the things within a budget have been a problem. When I think about the human skills part of it and development, I will tell you, I will take somebody hungry to learn all day long, who has a great attitude, who is developing their resilience. And that's really the the position that we're taking is that we have found, and it is rooted in evidence, you can find it everywhere, that when you don't have trust and communications and where people can actually communicate with each other in a respectful way, not getting away from dissent, disagreement's really good because that's how you get to good ideas. It doesn't matter how good they're at the actual role because they can't work with each other. So really my focus, which has been, you know, in healthcare, these are people who are already mission focused. They care about, you don't go into healthcare if you don't care about helping patients. What we did is said, hey, in learning and development, we care a whole lot about the patients, but we actually care about you first. Because you can't be good for the patient if we're not taking care of you. And so that's really the model of how do we help champion you as an employee or a future employee, but also what are we doing to help you grow through these? Because these are hard things to learn. When you're a first-time manager, you don't know how to coach. You don't know how to work with really difficult conversations because you may have not had to deal with that, but it's also not immediately identifying an individual contributor as the next leader. They are, it is a career change and it is a completely different role. And the more we do to help people realize that through programs like our emerging leaders, it is not necessarily preparing them to be a manager. It is helping them explore whether they want to be in mm. people leadership. And that's a different model because it's not saying, hey, we're, yeah, we're not preparing our next, let them choose. There's a power of choice when they understand, hey, you're taking care of people. So we don't use the language of managing people. It's leading people and managing things. You manage things. You do not manage humans. You lead them. And so it's really important that they have emotional intelligence and situational awareness. But we start with self first. So I got to know me really well and what I'm not so great at. And then let us help you you know, build some of those skills up. But two, here's what it takes to sit in these seats. And it's such an honor to sit in them, but it's not for everybody. So we want to make sure that people are really thinking about that before they move into it just for money or for something else, because there's a lot of things that go into leading people. It's funny to me because I'm uh, I'm currently sitting in a CEO role for an in-office anesthesiology company um, called Offer Health. And my chief operating officer, and her name is Beth Roberts, she says, I'll take a sponge any day over a rock, right? And that's what you're saying there. Like, gosh, if we can just teach them and know that they have that ability to learn and be molded, you can teach skills. I love that you're approaching it that way. I've been giving a talk this year entitled, I'm a CXO posing as a CEO, because my whole career has been in experience. But I got some fundamental mentoring and went back and actually got a degree in finance and under, to understand business acumen to how business ties to all things experience. And I have friends who are in the industry today in healthcare that they're like, what do I do next? Do I just go be a chief experience officer someplace else? 
And I'll get calls and they'll say, how did you become a CEO? I said, I learned how to be a business person too. And that was kind of in me. So, but I'm like, I'll say this, it's a whole new world for me. I'm all, you know, months into this process and things that I used to even talk about metrics wise that we needed to measure for experience. I've realized, no, just tie it to a business metric and make the whole world a whole lot easier. I love where you're going with that. So then how do you design learning opportunities that are focused on people instead of just creating experiences that check the box? Because as we know in healthcare, there's a whole lot of check the boxes that have to be done. Yeah. Well, I think it's one, talk to the people. So when we started really looking at when I came in, you know, there are a lot of existing programs and they had some really good stuff there. You know, it was just an opportunity to revamp it or reevaluate it. And so I said, gosh, have we ever asked the people in our organization, where do they think they need to be at? And so we took that by tier from vice president to director, to manager, to individual contributor and started really asking some dedicated survey questions to say, have we ever asked you this, number one? Number two, how are the programs for you today? Are you getting what you need? Do you know where to go? Because we have a really outstanding you know, LMS with a ton of curated content, but self-driven learning is not for everybody, right? And so we had to really understand what it is that they were looking for. And time after time, what people come back with is, I want to be able to handle a hard conversation. I don't want to be scared to ask a question of my direct leader or people who sit in a title higher than me. I want to feel smart. I want to look smart. And I want to be smart. Not in those words, but that's me synthesizing that. But two is I want to be able to leverage the skills that I already have. So I'm going after critical thinking and inquiry And how do we talk to each other? It's not even about having a hard conversation because it's very hard to go into, let's talk about a polarizing topic, which we need to do in DEI type activities and unconscious bias. But I, if I have trouble just communicating with you in basic things, I'm not equipped to be able to talk with you about my own unconscious bias, let alone yours. And so I look at what are the fundamental building blocks that are actually going to allow somebody to be better. So I don't I don't lock people into a box. And I love that you talked about being a CXO to a CEO. We so much label people of, oh, you've been a nurse. You can only fit in these. No, you know all the skills a nurse naturally has to have. They are making clinical decisions on the fly with the knowledge and tools that they have. They follow regulatory process, are incredibly detail-oriented, they're compassionate, and they care about people. Do you know how those skills can be leveraged in just an unbelievable amount of spaces? But on the flip side, somebody who sits in tech could be beautiful in the clinical realm. And so it's not putting this, this gating system of, oh, you can only be this. I've had that my entire career of, oh, you're in education. And I'm like, Yes, I am. And I've got adjacent skills that can do a whole ton of things. And that's how I landed in all these different areas because I said, gosh, you know, I think I can help you with that. And if we can help people see that the skills that they have actually lean into so many areas, but we tend to put them in this box of it can only be this. Now, I don't want to oversimplify that for areas that require higher level of license, like a nurse or a doctor or things that for safety purposes, among many other things, have to be done a certain way. But on the whole, in a lot of jobs, if we can start looking at, like I would hire somebody who worked in hospitality all day long to be in patient experience. I don't care that you don't have healthcare. You know how to work with people and you know how to improve the customer experience. Same skills apply in healthcare. Yeah, that's so funny you said that because this year at Offer, uh, we hired our new senior director of business development and account management. And of course, you know, everyone says, so what's their sales experience? What's their ability to run customer success teams? I'm like, you know, I don't know. We actually hired this guy. He w- used to be a, a chief experience officer. And they're like, what does experience? And I said, well, the last time I checked, business development and account management are all about building relationships. 
you build a great relationship, you can move people through the process of sales or whatever. And I said, guess who has great relationship building skills and don't come off as a salesperson? So people that work in experience. Mm-hmm. And um, it's been brilliant. So I love I love that. Like, let's not box people in. Um, yeah, what are the things that they can do and how does that lean into this area? And it requires a different level of thinking. But oftentimes I'll challenge people and I've been in interview processes where I picked a candidate, nobody else did. And they're like, why did you do that? And I said, look at what they've done and look at how that transcends into this area. They've got 20 years of experience in this. It just wasn't in healthcare. I can teach you healthcare. Yeah. Amazing. Well, okay. It's come to a little bit of a fun time now, Hillary. This is now known as our two minute drill around a how might we statement. So for our listeners who don't know about how might we statements, it's part of the methodology around human-centered design, or some people call it design thinking. And it's how might we question actually helps frame up a problem statement, but it brings um, diversity of thought in. So we're going to jam for two minutes. I'm going to let you start. I'm going to read you this how might we statement. And I just want you to start ideating all around it. Are you up for that, Hillary? Yeah, I'm going to try. I might I might not be awesome at it, but I'll do it. Uh, I think you're going to be pretty good at this. So how might we create learning experiences in the healthcare sector that drive change and create a people first care revolution? Go. Connect with the people first. Have conversations with your community and the needs within those spaces because we're servicing outside. Evaluating existing technology and how that's enabling the space, not driving it. What's working through measurement? So how do we know something's actually been effective and where have we seen tangible change? Are people happy to come to work? Are they learning how to do something new? Are they teaching each other in peer social networks? Are they creating their own networks and learning that are informal where they've become peer cohorts? Are they talking about the work that they do publicly outside of work? Is the word of mouth really strong? Are they saying, hey, you need to come work at this place because they spent time with us and I know how to do my job really well, but I also know that there's a lot of other things I know how to do and can do. I feel empowered. So I look for statements from people of saying really positive things. Uh, The culture's moving into a direction of innovation and creativity. That's what I got. (laughs) How about this one then? Let's talk even clinical. If doctors, nurses, we know they have those skills. What then if you could only hire people based off of who they are, not what they've done? Oh, well, to me, that's all about behavior, right? And so what kind of attitude do you bring into it? Are you curious? Do you think about how something impacts other people? Are you thinking about how your own behavior plays into that? Are you excited? Are you not afraid to say something that may be in a disagreement with other people? Are you the person that gets vocal when something's not working well? Okay, I've got one for you. Okay. And this is totally on the spot. So I know it. And you can say, I cannot believe you're going to ask me the question. (laughs) Do you ever hire just from your gut? Oh, sure. Sure. And some of that is based off of experience. And I know my gut, but also you have to be careful with your gut. I'm going to throw that out there because we all have inherent biases that even we're not aware of. So I have to double check that to say, am I hiring? Because this is something that I personally like, or is this what we need? So I do gut checks. So I might trust my gut to begin with, but I do gut checks before I do anything. Um, Awesome. Awesome. All right. So it has come to this time in the episode as we close up, that we do these things called the combustion questions. Three randomly selected questions by my own personal AI robot that automatically just text them to my phone. And so I have not read these questions. I have not looked at these questions until I read them to you. So, Hillary, are you ready for your combustion questions? I'm ready. Awesome. Combustion question number one. What's the biggest lie that you ever told as a child? I got to think about that one. I've had some doozies. I would say the biggest lie that I told as a kid 
probably was with my parents. One of my friends had a Cabbage Patch doll that I really wanted. And I said that they gave it to me and I took it. I took it that it wasn't mine. And I lied about it. I was so ashamed afterwards, but I really wanted it in the moment. It was awful. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. All right. Two. Cook, DoorDash, or eat out? Ooh, I like to cook. Can I answer that in two ways? Yes. So I like to cook during the week, but I actually love eating out with my friends on the weekend because it's like a, it's a social thing for us, an experience thing for us. So we like to break bread and enjoy each other over a meal out. So cook during the week, eat out on the weekends. Love it. All right. Last question. And this one you might have to think a lot about. What do you think about apples? Apples that I eat? Mm-hmm. Well, I think they're delicious, number one. I eat apples a lot. I'm grateful to have them readily available because it's an easy snack for me. I see them as a source of health because it's been ingrained in us from a kid. An apple a day keeps keeps the doctor, the dentist away. And I always think of Snow White with apples. <laughs> um, so it's like the craziest connection thing. I'm always like, oh, the poisonous apple. So that's where my brain goes. Love them. Love the answers. Well, Hillary, again, thank you so much. Um, for dropping such wonderful gems on us and your approach to learning and development within healthcare. I love it. I love what you're doing. Look forward to continue following you and hopefully working together on something in the future. But until we meet in person, until we talk again, um, be safe and be well. And thank you. Thank you, Sean. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of the Combustion Chronicles. If you've enjoyed this episode, please take a few minutes to subscribe, rate, and review. Remember that I'm always looking to meet more big thinking mavericks. So let's keep the conversation going by connecting on LinkedIn. If you want to discover more about human obsessed, maverick minded leadership, go to mofi.co or go to experienceevangelist.com. To learn more about my mission to challenge leaders to blow up outdated, siloed systems and rebuild them with an aligned, human-first approach. You can also learn more about OfferHealth's commitment to reimagining outdated healthcare models at OfferHealth.com. As always, stay safe, be well, and keep blowing shit up. <laughs>